<laughs> All right, so welcome everyone. Let's get started. So this is uh, CS 264. Uh, it's a sort of advanced algorithms or master's level algorithms class called Beyond Worst Case Analysis. And uh, every lecture I'll just, you know, at the beginning write on the board what are, what's the plan for the lecture. Uh, so today I'm going to start with a few motivating examples. You all hopefully know what worst case analysis is. I'll remind you why we might want to do it, why we might not want to do it. Uh, and then I'll introduce the first kind of main concept of the course, instance optimality. Uh, somewhere in the middle I'll break and just talk about sort of course announcements and what's expected and so on. Okay, but I want to start uh, with some motivating examples. <coughs> and so these three examples are meant to sort of clearly demonstrate the need for a course like this, the need for alternatives uh, other than worst case analysis. So, you know, it's lecture number one. This is mostly for intro and motivation. So the uh, description is going to be kind of informal, uh, but these are all topics that we'll cover in more detail uh, later on in the course. Right? So let me start by talking about caching. A problem that you've all, probably all seen, if not in an algorithms course, then in a systems course. Uh, so you have two types of memory, a cache, which is small and fast, and then a larger memory, which is slow. Okay. And depending on the context, these could mean different things. You know, maybe this, the cache is sort of an on-chip cache, and the slow uh, memory is main memory, or maybe actually the small fast memory uh, is main memory, and the large slow memory is disk. Okay, those are just two examples. And uh, so what happens is, is you have a program requesting data, okay? And uh, if the data is in the cache, great, you just read it directly. Uh, but if it's not, then you incur what's called a page fault or a cache miss and you have to pick a page in the cache for eviction and you have to bring in the requested page so that the program can actually read that data. And so then of course there's an algorithmic question which is when you got to evict something what should you evict? Okay. And so let me just write this down and then I'll explain with an example. So consider, say, a cache that, let's say, has room for four pages. So pages are just sort of blocks of memory, if you like. And uh, you're going along, and some program is requesting various pages. So let's say the sequence, the request sequence. So maybe the first four pages it requests are A, B, C, and D. So you promptly bring those into the cache. Maybe then D is requested again, no problem. Program has immediate access to it. Maybe then A is requested, again, no problem. It's sitting there in the cache, available. Now the, you know, party's over once E is requested, okay? So some fifth page which isn't in the cache. So there's four things in the cache, we've got to kick out one of A through D to make room for E, okay? It might get worse, maybe you know, the next request is F, and then again we have to kick out one of the four to make room for F and so on. And it's not clear, I mean we have to make some decision, and it's not totally obvious how to do it. Okay. Um, so, if, you know, as a thought experiment, if it turned out, if we were actually clairvoyant, and we knew everything that's going to happen in the future, then actually this is a well understood problem. Okay, so when we get to E, we have to evict one of A, B, C, or D, okay? And what's annoying is whichever one we evict, well, it might get requested again sometime in the future, right? So like if we evict A, maybe later A is requested, then we have to bring A back in. Okay? If A is never requested again, then we have no regrets about evicting it now. Now, you know, if all else being equal, intuitively, what do you want to evict? Well, you want to evict the page you're going to regret as, li as late as possible. Okay, so if A is going to be requested again tomorrow, you certainly don't want to evict it now, because then you just got to bring it back tomorrow. But if A is not going to be evicted for like, you know, hundreds of thousands of more page requests, then it seems like a good idea to evict. Okay? So there's a heuristic known as furthest in the future, which says of all the pages currently in the cache, figure out which one is going to be, like it says, requested furthest in the future and evict that. It's intuitively a good idea. In fact, it's optimal. It minimizes the number of cache misses over anything you could do. So this is a classic example of an optimal, greedy algorithm. 
But recall this was just a thought experiment. This assumed we had clairvoyance and knew when things were going to be requested next. Mostly in the caching problem, you don't. You have to make decisions on the fly. Okay? So we need heuristics. So what kind of heuristics might we use? Well, let me get the ball rolling and suggest one thing you certainly could try, which is first in, first out, or FIFO. So this would just save everything currently in the cache. You see which one was brought in furthest in the past, okay? And then it, that's its sort of expiration date, okay? So fair is fair. You've been here the longest, you have to go. So which would we be evicting in this case once E shows up? Yeah. So FIFO would evict A, replace that with E, and then when the F shows up, what do we evict? All right, so then when the F shows up, we evict B. All right? So that's what furthest, uh, oh, sorry, first in, first out would do. Okay? And at the moment, it's not clear if that's good or bad. All right? So um, what's another, you know, what have you heard of in some class that's perhaps a better heuristic than FIFO? How about hands? Yeah? Least recently used. Yeah, so there's one called LRU, or least recently used. And so here what you do, I mean, it's just like it sounds, okay? So if everything in the past, uh, sorry, everything in the cache, you look at when was the most recent time uh, that it was requested, and then the one that was, you know, most recently requested furthest in the past, that's the one you kick out. So for LRU, when the E shows up, what are we going to evict? B. Right? So we're not going to evict A, because A was requested very recently relative to when E shows up. Okay? So B is the, actually the most least recently used one. Okay? How, about, uh, how about when the F shows up for LRU, what are we going to evict? C. Yeah, C. Because right? we have E, A, D, all requested recently, C not so much. Okay? All right. So. You know, at the moment, I'm not going to, you know, so you could ask which is better, right? So if you're implementing a caching policy, which should you use? And, you know, I just want to point out at the moment, it's sort of not clear how to answer that question, right? So, for example, which of these, so these are two different caching policies. They did different things when E and F showed up. You know, and depending on what happens next, either way, you might regret what you did, right? So if, in fact, after the F, a, a C shows up, right? Let's see. So FIFO evicted, oh, sorry, the, the A and the B. So if an A shows up next, okay, you're going to be bummed out that you did FIFO instead of LRU. On the other hand, if a C shows up next, you're going to be bummed you did LRU instead of FIFO, or the reverse, excuse me. Okay? So depending on which request comes next, which of course you don't know, either one of these could look better in hindsight than the other, right? Because they made different decisions. Okay. So you could say, all right, well, you know, what happens in practice? What's true empirically? Um, and what you should have learned in a systems class like 140 is that basically LRU kicks butt. Okay, it's really good. <laughs> in any case, it's certainly better than FIFO. Okay? Uh, in fact, in practice, usually, L so LRU is sort of the gold standard, and generally, you know, so to implement LRU, you actually have to keep track for all the pages in your cache, when were they last requested. And that's actually kind of like a lot of work in some contexts. So what you often learn in systems is just how do you have good simulations of the gold standard of LRU using few resources. That's often what you, what you hear about. Okay, so that's, in some sense, we have this is the ground truth from practice, that LRU is a good and excellent caching policy. Um, and, oh, right, so what's the narrative? And so the, the reason why, so I mean, so first of all, experiments show this, but it's, it's, the intuition's easy to glean, uh, which is that in practical request sequences, practical data, if something was requested recently, it's likely to be requested again quite soon. Okay, so maybe, for example, if they're blocks of a program, you know, the program's working in some particular piece of code, and, you know, is doing some for loop, whatever, it's using these pages. Um, another way to think about it is that the LRU assumption is sort of that the past is predicting the future. 
And we know what to do if you're predicting the future, you want to do furthest in the future. So LRU is sort of a simulation of that benchmark, the furthest in the future algorithm, if you assume that the future is going to look like the past. The recent future looks like the recent past. Okay? So that's why, uh, the intuition, why it works. Now, believe it or not, and this is something I think you'll all appreciate more in the next couple weeks, it's surprisingly challenging to develop theory that conforms to, in some sense, this ground pr truth that we know from practice. Okay? So a challenge for research is to develop convincing theory that explains this well. So the caching problem has been around forever, so uh, the furthest in the future algorithm that's due to Bellotti, that's from the 1960s, it's really only last decade that we started having you know, truly convincing uh, you know, theory to, about how to think about the difference of why LRU is superior. And that's some of the stuff we'll be covering uh, in a couple of weeks. So uh, one of the reasons, you're know, looking ahead, so one of the things we're going to have to do is we're going to have to somehow model data, which is something you wouldn't have learned in an undergraduate algorithms class. Because in some sense, it's properties of real data, which is what makes LRU better than FIFO. So without modeling that aspect of the real world, you actually wouldn't expect theory to predict LRU to be superior. Okay, so that's one of the one of the things we're going to have to introduce. All right, so that's example number one. So example number two, I'm going to draw from linear programming. And I'm not going to assume that you've studied linear programming, but I, I do hope you've heard of it. So uh, what's going to be the issue with linear programming is, again, there's going to be some, so here not only is you know, the, the, the traditional theory not very convincing, it's just somehow outright wrong. So the kind of gold standard algorithm for linear programming, just the theoretical predictions for its performance are just you know, way too pessimistic. Okay? All right, so what's linear programming? So let's start with a picture. So most interesting linear programming problems are in high dimensions, but just think about two dimensions for starters. So you've got a feasible region, which in 2D is a, a polygon. So these are all the things that are possible. And what you want to do is maximize a linear function with respect to this constraint set. Okay, so maximizing a linear function is just like pushing as far in one direction as possible. Okay, so that's your objective. So the way I've drawn the picture, which is a little awkwardly the way I drew the picture, but I think that's going to be the optimal point. Okay, that's the furthest part in the feasible region in that direction. And uh, so if you like, uh, more algebraically, so this is you maximize a linear function. So C transpose X, so here X are the variables and C are the coefficients, so C is, is telling you the direction. Um, so over an intersection of half spaces. Okay, so that's the polygon. In general, you would say subject to the linear constraints, AX at most B. Okay? So here A, B, C, and X are all vectors, and A is a matrix. All right? So this is a very important class of problems. Those of you who have taken CS261 certainly know about it. Uh, very useful in practice to have fast algorithms for solving linear programming. It, it, it's sort of more general than lots of other famous problems like max flow, matching, and so on, yet it remains computationally tractable, both, in, both uh, in theory and practice, in some sense. Now again, just like with the caching problem, we somehow knew a good solution in the form of the LRU heuristic. Here we know an extremely good algorithm called the simplex method. Okay? And I'm not going to explain right now what this is. If you studied it, great. If you haven't, don't worry about it. Uh, what you should know is just that this is super fast in practice. Okay, so the empirical running time across you know, lots of different data sets, simplex method usually runs in like pretty close to linear time, where linear is the number of variables, i.e. the dimension of this space, i.e. the length of the vector x. 
OK, and that's the typical kind of performance that you see from the simplex method. It's very old. It's from the 1940s. But kind of amazingly, despite the fact that there's been lots of developments in linear programming over the past you know, 70 plus years, still typically today, uh, you know, most linear programs are solved using some suitably optimized variant of the simplex method. Okay, so it remains just a great algorithm for linear programming. So what does uh, theory, or specifically worst case analysis, say about the simplex method? Well, so there's a very cool but also very exasperating theorem of Clay and Minty. Uh, this is from around 1970, uh, which says that if you look at the worst case running time over all possible linear programs of a given dimension n, of the simplex method, then it's exponential. Okay, so rather than something like big O of n, it's something like 2 to the n. Okay? So this is not some minor misprediction of performance. I mean, this is way off. I mean, this basically says simplex. If you take this too literally, it says you shouldn't be able to solve problems with more than like 30 dimensions. And really, simplex can handle uh, problems with millions of dimensions. Okay, so it's orders of magnitude off as far as the size of problems that you can solve. Okay? Now, to make matters worse, at least for the worst case analysis perspective, is on the other hand, there are algorithms which do run in polynomial time in the worst case, but empirically are far worse than the simplex method. The most egregious of these is a method known as the ellipsoid method. Uh, that was actually the first ever proved worst case polynomial time linear programming algorithm. And it's, it's actually theoretically very useful, and it's a beautiful construction, but the, you, you'd, never want to run, you'd never want to run it on real problems. Okay? So we have sort of a double issue here. So first of all, it just says that at least for the specific context of uh, the simplex method, you cannot take worst case analysis very seriously. It gives you a disastrously pessimistic prediction of its empirical performance. But secondly, if you take it too seriously, it actually just recommends the wrong way to solve the problem. Okay, you should be using the simplex method. You should certainly, certainly shouldn't be using the ellipsoid method to solve linear programs in practice. So again, this disconnect uh, motivates a challenge, which again is, is just not very easy, although we'll t you know, there's been great progress mostly 21st century, and we'll talk about it, uh, which is developed theory, so an alternative to worst case analysis, to explain performance of the simplex method. On real inputs. So I should say the example of Clay and Minty is a sort of carefully contrived example meant to make simplex perform poorly. Okay, it's not like they took it from some industrial data set or something like that. It's a geometric construction explicitly uh, concocted to, to prove this point. Okay? And so what we're going to see here is, is we'll see, uh, you know, we won't, here we won't do all the proofs, but I'll definitely tell you about sort of the theory. And so it turns out this, you know, you really can prove in a rigorous sense that the simplex method runs in polynomial time on essentially almost all inputs. Okay, so it's sort of like an average case analysis, but on steroids. It's like a much more robust version of an average case guarantee. Okay, so that's something called smooth analysis, and we'll spend three to four weeks on, on smooth analysis, including its application to linear programming, deep in the course, weeks seven, seven and eight, something like that. Okay. All right, so that's example two of why we need alternatives to worst case analysis. Last example I want to talk about is clustering, okay? Or some of you might know this as unsupervised learning, okay? So finding patterns in unlabeled data, all right? So, you know, you want to think about something like maybe you have a bunch of images and you somehow represent the images in Euclidean space, maybe by their bitmaps or you have some features for them. And, you know, you're hoping to just sort of identify meaningful groups. Maybe these are pictures of cats, those are pictures of dogs, something like that, okay? Um, so goal, detect meaningful groups. You know, and, and so, and so usually the real problem in clustering has this sort of modeling issue that, you know, you sort of know a good solution when you see one, right? You sort of like, if you show me the clustering, I'm like, oh yeah, that's a good clustering. Show me a different one, you're like, no, that's a bad clustering, right? But, you know, to, you know, to really have an algorithm for it, you need, to, you need to have some more precise approach. And so the way usually people do this 
is they take an optimization uh, sort of approach. So they specify some kind of numerical objective function defined on clusterings. Maybe you've heard of things like k-means or k-median. These are examples, but there's many examples. And then having posited this, op this objective function on clusterings, you just optimize it. Okay? You find the clustering which makes this objective function as high or as low as possible, depending on if it's a minimization or a maximization. Okay? So posit objective and optimize it. Okay? And we'll talk about you know, some concrete formulations a little bit later. But the, the main points really cut across you know, all the ways that people formulate clustering problems. So what does theory say? Theory says that these are NP-hard problems. Okay? So for all of the standard objective functions, k-means, k-median, etc., cetera, uh, it's NP-hard. Okay, to find the best clustering. Okay? And of course, NP-hardness, as you know, that's a, that means in the worst case. It's a worst case notion, NP-hardness. So what's true in practice? Well, in practice, um, you know, the clustering problem, uh, maybe it's an exaggeration to say it's viewed as well solved, but I mean, people successfully solve clustering problems to a degree that they're happy with the solution all the time. Okay? So let's say fast algorithms usually give meaningful results. Okay, so maybe they get a few points wrong, whatever, but you know, you basically get your cats and dogs back in lots of different data sets. Okay. All right. So, once again, we have a disconnect. So the clustering problem, once you formulate it as an optimization problem and you apply the worst case lens, you get NP-hard problems, yet somehow lots of algorithms are doing something interesting. Okay, and we want to understand why. So the challenge here, for theory, is to formalize the following idea. So the thesis is that clustering problems is hard only when it doesn't matter. So what do I mean? Well, wh when do we care about clustering? We care about clustering when there is a meaningful clustering to be found. Okay? Now, you write down an objective function, like a, an optimization problem, and it's well defined whether or not there's a meaningful clustering. Okay? And to have a worst case algorithm, it means you have to solve every single instance whether there's a meaningful solution or not. Okay? And somehow the belief, and we'll look at recent attempts to formalize this, is that, well, if there actually is a meaningful cluster there, then somehow that should, the input should have extra clues, footholds, for an algorithm to make use of. And so somehow these cases of the problem should be easier than the worst case. So we might hope the clustering algorithms could do better in the worst case on the instances that we actually care about. So that's been a pretty hot topic for the past five years or so, and I'll definitely survey some of the key results. Um, about midway through the course. Okay. All right. So those are the examples. Now that we have a quorum, let me just say a little bit about the class. Uh, so what? So what are you wondering? You're probably wondering what do I got to do? All right. So here's here's what you have to do. So there's going to be weekly problem sets. They'll go out Wednesdays. Starting this Wednesday, they'll be due a week later. Uh, they'll be composed of both exercises and problems. Exercises are just sort of lecture details to be filled in. They're not meant to be very difficult. They're just sort of a framework to keep you keeping up with the lectures. Okay, and also it allows me to kind of defer some of the less interesting points from the lecture and focus on the good stuff, the juicy stuff in lecture, and then you can fill in some details on your own. Then uh, there'll also be some problems. They'll be harder, but there'll be few of them. Uh, and that's meant to further development in lecture. So often I'll discuss, you know, an idea, like today we'll talk about instance optimality at the end of the lecture, and I'm only going to have time to give you really one, you know, juicy example about instance optimality. That'll be on Wednesday's lecture, but through these problems you'll see that it also can be applied to other problems as well. And that's really, what, you know, one of the things I want you to take away from the course. You know, here are other ways you can think about designing and analyzing algorithms, but, you know, I also want to give you enough examples that you can imagine how you might then apply them to computational problems that come up in your own work. Okay, so in the lecture I'll give you some examples, but then the problems will develop more. Okay, so some, some, okay, so 
some uh, second order points around the homework. So if any of you are more interested in kind of delving into the research literature, there's an option, it's totally optional, but if you prefer, you can skip some of the problem sets, namely the last three out of the nine, and instead read a paper or two and write a, say, ballpark 10 to 12 page paper summarizing what you've learned, okay? Synthesizing one or two research papers. So that's an option, but again, you don't have to do it. Secondly, uh, I always require less of the pass-fail students from the letter grade students. So if you, you know, you can also audit, of course, but you know, for a lot of people, a sweet spot is sort of you take a pass-fail and then it's sort of a forcing mechanism. You actually come to class, you know, the whole quarter and so on. Uh, and so then, you know, I'll be explicit on the problem set instructions, but roughly you have to do kind of half the work of the problem sets for a, for a pass-fail grade, okay? All right, other announcements. In the green is Rishi Gupta. He's your uh, trusty TA. Um, he took this class a few years ago. He sort of, he's, and he works in this area, so he knows lots of stuff about everything I'll be talking about. Um, office hours will be posted later this week. Uh, what else? Oh yeah, so there's no textbook. Basically, this class doesn't exist except for you know, right here at Stanford, the one you're taking, uh, pretty much. Uh, there will be videos, as you can see. Those should be up on the website within one to two days after the lecture. Uh, I'll also be doing lecture notes. That'll take a little bit longer, but hopefully, you know, unless I'm traveling or have a huge deadline, say within two to five days uh, after the lecture. So I'll do my best, but I can't absolutely promise you'll have the lecture notes before homework is due. Okay, sort of best effort service, if you like. Okay, so questions about the course or about the motivating examples? Anything on your mind? Yeah, you had a question. Uh, um, the optimization objective, Yeah. I mean, it must be nonlinear because like you said before that or there's the ellipsoid method which solves linear optimization generally in non-NP-hard. So, so for linear programming, you need linearity in two senses. So the question was, you know, why can't you combine, why can't you apply example number two to example number three? That was basically the question. So linear programming, you need linearity in two senses. So first of all, it needs to be the objective function, which actually is the case for many, but not all of the clustering objectives. But you also need the feasible region to be uh, convex, the intersection of half spaces. And so clusterings are discrete objects. So the, the feasible region here is more of an integral discrete flavor. And if you have linear objectives and you have a discrete solution, those are often NP-hard. And that's the case for clustering, all of these clustering problems. Other questions? Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're going to see semi-random instances. Like we will. We'll have uh, one to two lectures on semi-random instances. There's been a lot of recent progress on that topic, but it's very technical. So I'm trying to see if there's some simple nuggets I can distill out. But there'll be one lecture for sure. Yeah. For graphs or for other things, or what were you wondering about? Yeah. Other questions? Yep. Midterms and finals? No. We're all adults here. <laughs> no midterms, no finals. So. Other questions? All right. Okay. All right, so having covered these examples, let me zoom out a little bit, okay? And uh, let's just be clear about something. Let's try to be clear about, you know, why are we even doing this? Why are we bothering to try to analyze algorithms mathematically as opposed to just like, you know, randomly think of, thinking of some and then running them and see how they do on some random instances that we sort of dream up. So what is the point of the mathematical analysis of algorithms? And one thing actually that even sort of seasoned, re seasoned researchers sometimes lose sight of is there's several conceptually distinct answers to this question. I'm gonna give you three. And different types of research in algorithms are really geared toward different ones of these answers. Okay, so that's worth keeping in mind. They're all good answers. I just, I just want to realize that they're different. All right, so the first thing, the first potential goal, I should say all of these are pretty challenging to achieve. Okay, so we've been doing the mathematical analysis of algorithms for over a half century, and um, you know, I hope you learn a lot in this class, but you'll also probably come away with the feeling that it's amazing we don't know more. And so there's lots of research to be done here too. 
So first goal, why do mathematical analysis of algorithms? Well, especially if you have some algorithm in mind already. Okay, so you already think you sort of know what you, either you have to use a particular algorithm or you have a gut sense that it's the right algorithm. You might want theory to give you an accurate prediction of that algorithm's performance, how well it's going to do, okay? So predict empirical performance. Let's say predict or explain. So maybe you even already know the performance and you just want a good mathematical model of why it performs the way it does, okay? So predict or explain empirical performance. And, um, you know, exhibit A here is probably uh, the second motivating example I gave you, which was linear programming. Okay, so simplex algorithm, it's not so much, you know, when, we, when we're trying to analyze a simplex algorithm, it's not that we're looking for some new linear programming algorithm. We're in some sense totally happy with the one that we have, because it's awesome. But we just, there's this, we, we're, it's just not acceptable to lack a theory that explains why it performs so well. So here it's almost like we're playing the role of a scientist. We observe this natural phenomenon, that this algorithm is super fast, and we want to understand why. Okay, what's the right way to explain or, you know, think about or generalize why it has such good performance. Okay. Now, one of the reasons why this is hard, uh, and this is something you don't see as much in undergraduate algorithms, is a lot of algorithms just have wildly different performance on different inputs. And again, simplex is a good example. Okay, it's linear time, lots of the time, but there are these weird inputs where it's exponential time. And they're really there. I mean, they're not, you know, they're real examples where it really does take exponential time. So it's not even really clear what I mean by talking about the V performance as a singular of an algorithm, because it can vary, it can vary widely, right? So how do you reason about that? Right? It's not easy. Okay, so that's the first goal. Just predict, have a good prediction of how well an algorithm is going to perform, or a good explanation, if you already know how it performs. So goal number two, and this is probably sort of maybe closest to at least the way I teach undergraduate algorithms, is we're really looking for advice, right? So we're kind of thinking of ourselves as like, you know, the end user, right? And so many of you will be, you know, to go on to be software engineers, you'll be in this perspective. You kind of figured out what kind of problem you have, you know, you figured out it's a shortest path problem or whatever, and you want to know, look, I, I know there's several algorithms for shortest paths, I can dream up some more, which one should I use, okay? Tell me what to do, tell me the, tell me the best algorithm, all right? So rank different algorithms, by performance. All right. Now I want to point out, so you know, while goal number one and goal number two are, you know, they're both sort of pointing in the same direction. They're both asking for kind of a good understanding of algorithm performance. They're, they really are incomparable. Okay, you can really solve either one without solving the other. So specifically, you could have a mathematical analysis, like worst case analysis, which maybe it's very pessimistic, all right? So if you're using worst case analysis, maybe it always overestimates the performance, or sorry, it, it sort of overestimates the running time, let's say, of every algorithm. But if it still gets the ordinal ranking correct, right, you still just read off the best of the algorithms, it actually is excellent advice about which one to use, okay? So you can solve, and there are plenty of examples, and we'll see some, where you can solve the second goal without solving the first. Okay, so you, you shouldn't take sort of the predictions literally, just their ordinal ranking. Conversely, when you, do, you, when you do explanation or predictive work, usually you have a fixed algorithm in mind. So for one algorithm, you might have a very good understanding of it if it's fast or slow, but you know, there's other algorithms out there which your analysis doesn't apply to. So usually, when you, this may seem stronger, but generally, you know, the theorems you prove along goal number one don't allow you to just immediately solve goal number two. And again, the reason I'm teasing these apart, I mean, later on, you're going to learn a lot of different ways to model algorithm analysis, and so we'll keep revisiting these, you know, to clarify which of these goals are we trying to achieve, and then, of course, once I tell you about what people have done, we can assess, have they achieved it or not, or to what extent. So we'll come back to these, don't worry, but I just want to kind of lay out the land in this first lecture. All right, so here's goal number three. which is the one researchers are kind of, you know, most familiar with, researchers and algorithms at least, which is to guide the development of new algorithms that we haven't yet thought of. Okay? 
So whenever you have some sort of performance measure, like say the worst case running time of an algorithm, it gives you, it, it sort of gives this yardstick that then focuses the effort of often lots of people to devising better and then hence new algorithms, right? And if you think about it, a lot of the, you know, again, when I teach undergraduate algorithms, often I'll teach you, you know, I'll teach you the N squared sorting algorithm. And then we say, oh, can we do better, right? So we just have this like yardstick. I'm gonna keep getting lower and lower and lower and lower. And to take a step lower, we have to have a new idea, right? And those are sort of, you know, treasures in algorithms research, right? New ideas for designing algorithms. So the reason people sort of want to do this mathematical analysis, have these yardsticks, uh, is, to, is to really guide you to um, new ways of solving problems, okay? All right. And, uh, right, so I should say, um, you know, it's, you know, for this to be justified, it is not crucial that the new algorithms that you develop are automatically, say, practically useful. Hopefully, sometimes they are, but, you know, just sort of having this kind of analysis framework, if it, links, if it sort of organizes your brainstorming, that's actually a very productive application for a theory, okay? All right. So, let's just be clear about what I mean by worst case analysis as you've seen in undergraduate algorithms. And let's review from undergraduate algorithms why this can be very useful. And then let me just sort of reiterate why sometimes it's inadequate, which is the point of this class. So by definition, what, what do I mean by this? So you have an algorithm, and it performs differently on different inputs. Worst case analysis just means you only pay attention to its worst performance on any input. Okay, so you summarize the performance of an algorithm very coarsely. So say you have an algorithm A. So I'm just going to write cost of A comma Z for, let's think of it just being the running time, if you like, of a given algorithm A on a given input Z. Okay? Worst case analysis just says you look at the max over all input Z. Often this is parameterized by the input size. Right? So you think of an algorithm having worst case running time O of N log N. Okay? Something like that. I want to emphasize that the comments I'm making and the examples we'll see in class are not limited to just running time. This could be, there's lots of other cost measures you might care about. You might care about space. You might care about input output operations. We'll see a lot of examples where what you care about is solution quality. So you're trying to find a good traveling salesman tour, something like that. And this would be the solution quality of the output of a heuristic, okay? So that's what I mean by worst case analysis. Any questions about that? So, for example, when I teach undergraduate algorithms, I think at least 90% of what I do is in this. Okay, so this is really sort of the dominant paradigm for algorithm analysis. Okay, so why? What's the excuse? What's the reason? Well, so the first reason is, in the happy case, where you can prove a worst case bound which is good, then, you know, you're home free. Right? Basically, you can just, you know, Forget about the problem. You just have a, you know, always awesome solution to the problem. So good upper bound. Um, basically awesome algorithm. And, you know, in undergraduate algorithms, I sort of cherry pick examples where this is the case, right? So the bulk of the algorithms that I teach have worst case running time close to linear. Right? And there are problems where you have to read the input, so no algorithm is going to be better than linear. Okay, so there, there are algorithms which basically, you know, the algorithms are, it almost reduces to reading the input, right? And that's just sort of the holy grail in algorithms. That's just something you can put in your pocket. Whenever your data fits in main memory, you can just take it out of your pocket and apply it. Maybe you don't even know why. You don't even know why you want to sort. You don't even know why you want to do a shortest path, you know, this kind of thing. But just do it for fun, you know, it's, <laughs> it's harmless, right? I call them four free primitives, okay? So that's one thing, is in the happy case where good, good upper bounds exist, you're just very happy. There's no, I mean, no one can argue with you, right? Another reason is that it's often easier to analyze. Uh, 
Right, so it's pretty amazing. It's pretty great that in an undergraduate class, you know, which is probably half sophomores, I teach a complete analysis of, say, the running time of quicksort or the running time of Dijkstra's algorithm with heaps. I mean, it's completely fundamental. These are cornerstones of computer science, and yet I can teach these proofs in a fraction of a lecture to sophomores. It's amazing. It's great. And it gives you great, gives you great advice about how to solve those problems. And the other thing I want to point out is, you know, so you could criticize worst case analysis as being unrealistic, and it is. But you know, one thing to keep in mind is, you know, realism per se is not, you know, usefulness of a model is not necessarily monotone in its realism. All right? So a more realistic model from which you cannot deduce any conclusions because it's too complicated and intractable is not helpful. Okay? So we're really we're always looking for the sweet spot in modeling of retaining enough of the salient properties of analysis subject to just being able to deduce conclusions for them. So maybe this is too far on one end, you know, maybe this is too simple, but remember, you know, more realism isn't always a panacea. Okay? All right, so three, the third pro, which is sort of related to, the, to number one, is that you don't even need to try to understand your inputs, okay? You do not need any kind of domain knowledge to feel confident that running this algorithm is a good idea, okay? It's just an input by input guarantee. It's always good, okay? And there are contexts where that's exactly what you want, right? So think canonically, say, about sorting and searching, right? So imagine you're, you've been tasked with writing the default sorting subroutine for some new programming language. Okay? Which you're hoping is going to go viral and be adopted by millions of people. Right? Like what's your domain knowledge about these millions of different people that are going to be invoking your sorting routine? Right? You have like none, basically. You have no idea. Okay? You really want it to be useful spanning lots of different application domains. Okay? So in that sense, this really is the kind of guarantee that you want. All right? So lots of reasons. Lots of reasons to use it. So the motivating examples have sort of already exposed the reasons why you might not want to use it, but let me just kind of summarize those succinctly here. So the first one is sort, of, is sort of obvious. I mean, evidently, I mean, this is really the most pessimistic summary of an algorithm's performance that you could ever use. Right? You cannot be more pessimistic than this, all right? Which is fine, but I mean, the worry is that at least, especially if you think about that first school, about predicting performance, then this probably seems a little crazy, right? I mean, this is, this is potential to be wildly inaccurate, a, a summary of how, how, well, how well an algorithm performs empirically. Again, simplex uh, being sort of the canonical example, where you just have a radical mischaracterization of simplex's empirical performance by focusing on uh, that worst case. So pessimistic, but the point really being, therefore, inaccuracy, okay? Potentially. Um, and sort of for this reason, because you can be, once you're sort of very inaccurate, then you know, it opens the possibility you'll start ranking algorithms you know, very sort of empirically incorrectly with respect to each other. Okay? So it can rank algorithms incorrectly. So for example, in the caching problem, you know, it doesn't actually say, you know, the theory, as we'll, as we'll see in, in next week, it doesn't say that F5, FIFO is better than LRU. It just says they're basically the same. It says it doesn't matter. Okay, so that's not very helpful. Linear programming, as we saw, you, you really just, you know, the, the advice is just very bad, poor, that comes out of worst case analysis. Okay, it says simplex is bad and other things are good. Okay. So the third con that I'm going to list is actually the same as the third pro, okay? So in some sense, the strength of the worst case model is also its weakness. Uh, so a couple of things. So first of all, you know, especially if you're designing an algorithm that's at least sort of for some domain, you, I mean, generally practitioners like to think of, you know, there's some model of data. You know, maybe they can't articulate it, maybe they don't know what it is. You know, maybe they believe in some generative model, maybe they don't, but there's still some notion of like the data sets typical to this domain or typical to the real world. And if you think about it, the worst case model, I mean, in a strong sense, there is no coherent model of data, model of the world that corresponds to the worst case analysis perspective. Or if there was one, you'd have to call it the Murphy's Law data model, <laughs> right? Because like literally, like what the input is depends on the algorithm that you choose. 
Or you choose algorithm A, you're gonna get the worst case for that. You choose algorithm B, you're gonna get the worst case for that, right? So it's just, I mean, it's just incoherent, right? So it doesn't make sense. Furthermore, if you think about the first motivating example and the third one, so caching and clustering, you know, the properties of actual data is crucial to deducing what we sort of know to be true, right? So in the caching context, we know that LRU is better than FIFO, and we even know the reason. It's because real data has locality of reference, okay? And you know, if, and you could, you know, and so really, you need to be able to articulate that in your model if you expect to be able to drive the conclusion that LRU is better than FIFO. Similarly, in clustering, it's not that we really are sort of objecting to theory saying that these clustering problems are hard in the worst case. We're not really refuting that. Again, we're just saying, well, properties of real-world data mean we're not in these hard instances. Okay, and the key thing is, if you're doing worst-case analysis. That, you know, by construction, there's no way to articulate any kind of special properties of your domain. Okay, just, it just takes that language away from you. Okay, you're just stuck with the worst one. So, understanding lots of algorithms, understanding lots of problems, you need some sort of part of your model that allows you to encode domain restrictions. Worst case analysis doesn't give you that. Okay? All right. So, those are the pros and cons. Any questions about any of that? Then, oh right, so why did I do this? Right, so I want, well, let's judge, or let me, let me sort of opine how well worst case analysis does with respect to the three goals. Okay, I just erased the first two, here's the third one. So why, do a math, why, why analyze algorithms mathematically? Empirical predictions of performance, ordinal ranking of algorithms so that you know, you know which one to use, which one's gonna do the best, and guide the development of new algorithms. So I would say that on this third goal, worst case analysis has been just you know, a runaway success. Okay, really it's led to the development of a huge number of new algorithms, new ideas for tons of different problems, tons of different data structures, some of which have been useful. So that's been great. Okay, so I'm really not here to criticize it. Okay, I'm here to really complement it with additional modeling tools. Now on the second goal, this was the ordinal ranking. Here, it sort of depends on the problem. I mean, I could, I could tell you lots of problems, or rather you saw lots of problems in undergraduate algorithms, where it gives you actually really good advice about how to solve problems. Okay, like Dijkstra's algorithm implemented with heaps. Okay, it really is a great way to solve the problem. It's good in both theory and practice. I could also give you lots of problems where it gives you bad advice. In fact, you saw some in this lecture. Okay, so it's sort of medium on sort of ranking algorithms. On the first goal, predicting performance, I would argue it's clearly just not meant to do that. Okay, it just really is pessimistic for, you know, again, if you're worst case, almost linear time, there's only so pessimistic it could be, because you have to read the input, there's only so far off it could be. But, you know, modulo that exception, you've really kind of, as soon as you adopt this, given up on, on making serious predictions. Okay, so that's really not what it's meant for. Okay, so that's my summary about how the report card, if you will, for the dominant paradigm on these research goals I've given you. So I want to introduce one new concept before I leave you today. Which is that of instance optimality. Okay. Oh yeah, so this is, uh, as a concept, this was really emphasized by Fagan, Lodum, and Noor. So on the web page, I'll be putting you know, links to references if you're curious, if you want to delve deeper. Um, and what, one thing that's cool is this paper actually just this year, in 2014, it won uh, one of the big test of time awards. It's called the ACM Girdle Prize, which is given once a year uh, to a sort of influential theory paper from the past 12 years or so. Okay, so this instance optimality paper just won that this year. All right, so. With instance optimality, it's very clear which of those three goals that we're focusing on. Okay, we're really focusing on goal number two. So goal number two is one which says, you know, I don't care about predicting performance per se, just tell me which one's the best, okay? So, rather than tell me which one's the best, let's start with an even sort of simpler problem, which is suppose we just have two algorithms on the table, A and B. Just tell me which one is better, okay? 
So how would you answer that question? And again, what I want to emphasize is, you know, remember, already in the caching problem, we saw the issue with LRU and FIFO, which is, you know, I can show you sequences where FIFO is better than LRU. Okay, it's not hard to construct them. Of course, I can show you sequences where an LRU is better than FIFO. So they're sort of incomparable unless you're willing to sort of sit down and make, you know, you answer hard questions about how to trade off different inputs, all right? So this week, what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically show you some very happy cases where we can punt on trade-offs between inputs and just say something very strong. There aren't a lot of problems that we can do this for, but there's a couple, and we want to, you know, want to start the course with those. So suppose you wanted a, a really uncontroversial way to say an algorithm A was better than algorithm B. Whoops. So under, in, on, in which situation could we do this without, you know, offending anybody? Without uh, inviting any debates? Well, we'd have a very clear answer if one of the algorithms dominated the other one in the following sense, suppose that A was just better than B on every single input, okay? You know, as long as you believe in the cost measure, okay, which we're just going to take as given in this course. Again, the cost could be running time, space, solution quality, whatever. So if we've agreed on the cost measure, and if this is true, no one in their right mind could suggest using B over A. They'd have to agree A is the better of the two algorithms. Okay? All right, so that's the simpler question. How do you answer a question between two algorithms? So now let's return to the question how, you know, so if you wanted to say that an algorithm was optimal in an uncontroversial sense, what would be a, de a proposed definition. And that's the notion of instance optimality. Okay, so algorithm A is instance optimal if star holds, so if A dominates every other algorithm. Okay? So if you, can, if you have a problem and you can find an algorithm A which is instance optimal in this sense, this is, you know, the definition of a no-brainer. Okay? Always use algorithm A. And again, remember the goal here, the goal was, you know, is there any case where we can not even worry about what the input is? Okay? There's no hard compromises to make across different inputs. And this is it. Okay? So for example, we know that, you know, if we take A and B to be LRU and FIFO, and we take cost to be the number of cash misses, we know that this inequality does not hold in either direction, okay, for LRU and FIFO. So this already is getting kind of rare, that you have two algorithms where one is always better than the other. To have one algorithm which is always better than everybody, this is a very special case indeed. Actually, to be honest, with this definition exactly as stated, I don't know of a non-trivial problem for which there exists an instance optimal algorithm. So remember, always remember, you know, definitions are cheap until you see examples, all right? So for here, I don't actually know any interesting examples, but if we relax it in two, you know, reasonably modest ways, there are examples, and that's the point of this week, okay? So relaxations. So the first relaxation is that we will allow a small constant factor, you know, maybe something like two, on the right hand side. So while maybe A isn't strictly better than every other algorithm B on every single input Z, it's you know, never outperformed by mo more than a factor of two. Okay, so in some sense your regret for using A instead of some algorithm tailored for the specific input is bounded and small. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing, uh, is that we will restrict B to 
what I'm just going to call informally natural algorithms. Okay. So notice in the definition of instance optimal, the way it's written, it says that A should dominate every single algorithm B, no matter how crazy it is. So the relaxed version is going to say A should dominate every natural algorithm B. Now, the definition of natural sort of depends on the problem, but intuitively what it's meant to do, it's meant to prevent, it's meant to disallow algorithms which in some sense have memorized the solution to Z. Okay, and th those are the kind of algorithms that sort of for uninteresting reasons make this guarantee impossible to achieve. And again, we'll see both in the examples uh, that you study on the homeworks and the ones that I'll talk about at length on Wednesday, there's a very natural, you know, and you know, pretty uncontroversial way to define natural algorithms to prevent that memorization. Okay? So, in the homework that I'll go out Wednesday, I'm going to ask you to study the model originally proposed by Fagan et al., where they first explored this notion. Uh, that's motivated by the problem of searching a bunch of sorted lists. And so you have a mixture of sequential and random access, and you pay for every sequential access. And they propose an algorithm which is instance optimal in this sense. Uh, and was, again, there's some natural notion of natural algorithms, and also they have a small constant factor here. Uh, and then on Wednesday, I'm going to show you that uh, really for a, a fundamental computational geometry problem, that of identifying maxima of point sets, there's a very old algorithm from the 80s, and it's a beautiful divide and conquer algorithm. And that turns out to be instance optimal, again, among, in some sense, all algorithms that can't memorize the input. So that's what's coming up. I'll see you then.